Hi, I'm the founder and CEO of Harlem America Digital Network and the host of What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. Uh, that's me. <laughs> now, if you're a LaBelle fan, then you're going to really enjoy listening to this week's podcast with the legendary Miss Sarah Dash. Welcome to What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander, the crossroads where culture, lifestyle, and community meet, all hosted by the legendary New York radio TV personality and proud Harlem American, G. Keith Alexander. Hey, welcome to What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. And I just want to say I am so happy that you are joining us today because we've got a wonderful uh, conversation that we're going to have today with Miss Sarah Dash. Now, let me tell you, Sarah Dash defines the word legend. As an award-winning vocalist, songwriter, motivational speaker, educator, entrepreneur, and humanitarian, Sarah is a unique force whose voice has touched millions of listeners around the world. From co-founding Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells and making history as a member of LaBelle to becoming a very, the very first music ambassador of Trenton, New Jersey. Sarah has blazed a trail in every facet of her remarkable career, and she joins us today on What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. Welcome, Sarah. Hello, G. Keith Alexander. How are you? I'm doing quite well. Thank you very, very much. And as you can see, I've got this broad smile on my face as I uh, see you and, uh, and getting ready to, to talk with you. So, you know, recently, you just enjoyed a birthday. And, yeah. and, 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 and it's a milestone birthday. How do you feel about that? Well, um, you, you're only 75 one in your that's life. That's true. That, that's true. And um, I, look, I take it from a spiritual place right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm elated and I'm so thankful to God that he has given me this time on earth. So my feelings are I'm, I'm still doing, you know, what I do, you know, bearing in mind what we're facing, pandemic and all. And uh, because I have this quiet time, I'm asking my higher power, and that means God, what do you, what would you have me to do next for the next 25 years? Has he uh, told you yet? Excuse me? Has he told you yet? Well, every day there's something that I didn't do yesterday. <laughs> oh, so that's part of the direction. But I think what has really enhanced my thought process regarding mm -hmm. the age is to continue to do good and to do better, to, to be better, uh, mm -hmm. to go uh, further into the humanitarian side of helping people and also not to forget about self. Well, very, very good. So now, uh, in this stage of your life, you're still very active. You are uh, the ambassador of music for Trenton, New Jersey. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, I um, was with the mayor, Eric Jackson, who appointed me originally. Um, he... We were talking about my position being uh, governor for the Grammys. And he had just been elected to the city of Trenton as mayor. And um, the very first time I met him, he reminded me, first time meeting him, we went, we, I was at a rally for Mother's Day. And he said, I turned around and looked at him and said, you know, you may be running for mayor now, uh, 
you may not win your race now, but you are one day going to be mayor of Trenton. And he said it stuck with him. And he continued in the next process of running, you know, the next candidate, uh, what do you call it, candidate? When you're a candidate. Camp, you're campaign and you're running the campaign. Campaigning yeah. for the next four years. And um, he said, as a result of that, I want to make you um, music of uh, ambassador for music and arts for the city of Trenton. And some call me the capital ambassador, some call me Trenton's ambassador, but what we have been trying to do with that title and that name was to continue to work from the arts and music direction of the city. Trenton used to be the main D market for entertainers to come through. Say if you were playing New York and you had a stopover point, it would be Trenton and then you would go to Philadelphia. Hmm. So Jackson, Mayor Jackson didn't, at the time that he appointed me, he had one more year in office. When Mayor Reed, who is now the current mayor, Reed Garciara, um, decided that I should continue my ambassadorship under his uh, mayorship. So I'm here to do that now. <laughs> Fantastic. Now let's talk about being, being that you are the music ambassador, let's talk about where it all comes from. So uh, tell us about uh, what I've always wondered uh, was how did the change come from Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells to LaBelle with those fabulous space outfits and, uh, you know, and looking all beautiful and svelte and all that stuff. How did that happen? You mean when I had a waistline? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. When you had a waistline. <laughs> well, we actually, um, Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells had gotten stale. Um, we've been playing all these places that wasn't really making a change in our life. But in the meantime, we were um, traveling and was uh, able to go to the UK to do a very special show produced by a woman named Vicki Wickham. And the name of that show was called Ready, Steady, Go. We stayed in touch with Vicki. And as things began to get stale, I, at the time, didn't do a lot of phone calls. You know, you, didn't, you had what, phone booths. But I was a writer. I loved to write letters and thank you notes as my mother and father trained me to do. So I wrote to Vicki and said, I, we're at a stale point. I don't know what we're going to do. She said, what are the dates are you going to do? I'll be in New York soon. One of them was the Apollo. And uh, Smokey Robinson was on the show. Uh, he was the headliner. And we, she said, we're, I'm bringing some people there to meet you, I think, to see you. I think you all should, you know, think about a new direction. Those people were the management of who. We got on that stage, we tried to burn that stage down. <laughs> and rest with us. And, you know, bearing in mind that the old management wasn't working when we needed new management. And Smokey didn't speak to us for a long time, but, you know, we. We, we did a wonderful show. And with that, they decided to take us to London. When we went to London, we stayed there nearly a year or more. And we came back and we now are not going to be Patty LaBelle and the Bluebells. We are now simply called LaBelle. And Vicki Wickham, um, as the WHO management no longer worked for us, Vicki Wickham continued as our partner and manager. And with that, we started dressing with individual styles. Uh, you know, our individual personalities came through. And yet we were not singing like a lead singer and two background singers. We were singing with a force that each one of us may have been leading a song, but within the notes that we were singing. And we were, uh, there was a designer by the name of Larry Legaspi who would come to see us. He had a store called Moonstone, hence the space clothes. Moonstone. Ah, okay. Yeah. okay. Yes. And uh, he was the creator of all those styles, the feathers and the piping. And uh, we were innovators at that time because there were a lot of artists now 
black artists who decided that they could also not wear the same shoes and the same gowns and wigs. And as you see uh, artists today, and that is the result of the work that LaBelle, LaBelle did, you know. Do you remember how we met or when we met? Yes, I remember what I was wearing that night. Really? Well. Tell me, because... Uh, I was wearing a white leather halter top dress that had a picture of a rose going up the side and around the front of my dress. Uh, we were appearing at a place called... Um, it wasn't the Met. What was it? Oh, the Avery Gate? Fisher Hall. Oh, Avery Fisher Hall. Okay. Yes. And that's when I met you. The first really? Time. Wow, because uh, I've been trying to figure out when we met. Uh, you know, I did not know that you were a cougar. I was a what? A cougar. A cougar? Yes. Oh? How, yeah, how, how long did we date? How old would I have been? No, 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 no. Uh, uh, how, how long did you and I go out we went out about two days <laughs> about two days <laughs> uh, irene gandy did that to us she's the one who introduced us see you know my i i, I was trying to piece it all together but yes. I, I i could not figure out where we met how we met but i do know that when you guys we're down at the uh, village gate on Mondays. I used to come down yes. uh, and, 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 and I used to enjoy watching and being there with you guys and, and, and being back in the, in the dressing room. Uh, but let's get back to this cougar business. What are you talking about? You didn't know it was a well, well, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, you know, all of the, uh, the, um, with, with the exception of my first husband, most of the, of the men, were younger than me because I have a young spirit, as you can see. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't associate relationships with age. Mm -hmm. I really associate them with character and go. with spirit and with you know how the respectful level of how one approaches you know each other. So I could I could hang out most of my friends or I should say people that I know are younger than me. All of them are. I mean, I have such a great relationship with all the grand nieces and nephews mm -hmm. in my family and um I get along with people of all ages, but I'm constantly um around younger people because I'm I'm mean, sort of a teacher type person, you know, kind of mentor type personality. Um, I'll tell you what to do. I'm not bossy, but I'll be honest with you. Oh, cougar. I, well, think, I'll, well, I think I'll nickname myself that. <laughs> Dash. Now, well, now, let's talk about Center Man. Center Man, yes. Center Man was after you left the group or yes. you, you guys decided to kind of separate for a little while to do your own solo projects. Uh, how did well, Center Man uh, come about? How did Center Man come about? Well, yes. actually, uh, when we split as a group, I was the last one to be signed uh, to a label. Mm -hmm. um, there was, um, and that was with Don Kirshner. Don Kirshner, and it was Kirshner Records. Kirshner um, what, and his wife, Sheila, were also friends. And I used to go to baseball games with them because they had the best seats in the house. <laughs> so I made sure I was always invited to go with Sheila and Donnie to see the baseball games. And Donnie was like asking me, when are you going to record? And I said, no one wants me. The demos that I did was horrifying. They were horrific. They were not, um, I wasn't pleased with them. I went along with them because at that point we were all talking about, oh, we're gonna do solo stuff. 
Mm -hmm. I, I was mainly a, a person, a singer who backed up voices, although some of us did lead and do lead. But anyway, I got with Perishner and he signed me. But for six months, we worked on learning songs, teaching me new songs, going back to some of the old songs, doing small cabaret clubs. Um, and he trained me, uh, his writers, group of writers and producers. But the last night before um, a closing of a show, mm -hmm. he sent two writers down to see me, and that was Carol George and Rob Hago. And they saw, they saw this little woman running around the stage. I was singing some song about, you know, are you, you lonely tonight? And they said all they could think about was this a center man, and I should not, and, and I'm telling them, don't touch me. So that was the last song that was written for my solo album. Uh -huh. And the first song I recorded, I did Center Man in one take. That's how well really? rehearsed I was. So when you listen to Center Man, it's a one take song. Hmm. Very interesting. Recording, rather. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So, yeah. uh, okay, so from Center Man, how did you get with the Rolling Stones? I mean, that had to be a, 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 a blessing, a, a, a leap. How did that happen? Well, Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells did the Rolling Stones' first American and Canadian tour. Mm -hmm. We opened for them back in the 60s, the late 60s. And um, as a result of that, Keith and I were always sort of like the buddies during the tour. You know, um, we had the chaperone and, and manager, but we... We uh, that you know we were buddies. Mm -hmm. um, when we went to Europe, the Stones would always come and see us because you know we worked with them. Mm -hmm. But I was one uh, day having uh, was asked to come to the record company to have a holiday drink with the president of the of CBS Records. And when I got there, the the um, they weren't ready for me. And so I said, well, who's, who's he in there with? They said, Keith, I said, tell Keith I'm outside. Keith comes out, he says, you're the voice I want for Keith Richards and the expensive winos. I'm going, I said, are you sure? You don't want me to call Patty? You know, and he's like, no, I want your voice. Wow. And um, with that, he said, I'm going away for the holidays. I'll call you. Mm -hmm. Came back and he called me. I went to the studio, recorded a duet called Make No Mistake. From We toured, we did three world tours as the expensive winos. And uh, the latest edition, they're releasing a new box edition next month, in fact, uh, November. Um, in fact, I have it here with me. But uh, it's a new box edition with a photo album book, all the recordings we ever did. And that is Keith Richards and Expensive Winos. So I morphed over into recording with the Rolling Stones. And I'm on Steel Wheels, a platinum selling uh, CD. So that's how I got my, my size six feet over to the Stones. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fantastic. We have about 30 seconds left before we go to break. And I just okay. want to take this time to say hello to the folks up in uh, Canada who listened to us last week on our show. We had about, according to our analytics, we had about 469 people in Canada wow. listening to us. We also had people in China, Ireland, Jamaica, and <laughs> France. So I just want to give a shout out to those folks. Continue to listen. Please spread the word and uh, let folks know that uh, they can check us out every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, and this is What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. And we'll be right back. Tune in every Friday to get your weekend kickoff early. Join the legendary G. Keith Alexander for What's Hot Harlem America. The flagship show of the new Harlem America Digital Network has something for everyone. 
From the latest in entertainment to empowerment, health and wellness, and more, we'll bring you a variety of fresh viewpoints, voices, and ideas. What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander can be heard every Friday at 1 p.m. in New York and 10 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Variety Channel. Thank you so very, very much. We're here with the wonderful uh, Sarah Dash of Legend in her own making. Uh, I mean, making. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, all, all the work that you've done and everything, you, you, okay. you made yourself a legend, you know, all the, all the, uh, the wonderful hits and things. So let me ask you, we're here on Harlem America, and yeah. you've been to Harlem many times. What, I do you have. Like, what do you enjoy about Harlem? Uh, well, you know, being the called the sweethearts of the Apollo, as Patty LaBelle and Bluebells we were, you know, we spent a great deal in Harlem. I always enjoyed the soul of the people. Um, you know, there was always something going on in Harlem when we were there. We there were people coming by with hot goods. You know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know. This is so, one time, a man stole. He was stealing his shoes so fast. He bought all rights on each side, right shoe to the left. I mean, this is always something, but. The Apollo Theater is actually the heart, it was the heart of Harlem. And people got to come to Harlem because of the Apollo. Wouldn't you agree? I would uh, agree wholeheartedly. Yeah, and then you had Smalls, uh, those nightclubs. You had Wells where you could go get wonderful chicken and waffles. We would, even though I lived on the Upper West Side downtown in the 70s, um, if I was home on the weekends and sometimes during the week, uh, it, we would just take a car uptown to uh, Wells and get chicken and waffles or, you know, um, there was always some blues person to see at Smalls, Paradise, um, and uh, there, it, just to walk the streets, uh, everyone in Harlem knew you, mm -hmm. you know, if you were a performer, if you played the Apollo, they knew who you were. It just... You know, it was just wonderful. It was like being home outside of your home. Um, wow. And so many wonderful things and people, you know, have come from Harlem, you know. Well, speaking of Harlem, yeah, which you've given me a wonderful segue into this public service announcement I'd like to do for the community. The Greater Chamber, the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce continues to work tirelessly through the pandemic experience in concert with our medical, education, business, banking, elected officials, nonprofits, and individual partners to provide much needed services to support those most severely impacted by the pandemic, social inequalities, systemic racism, and economic challenges, the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce has created a GoFundMe campaign Support Harlem Now, assisting our senior citizens, children, students, small businesses, food banks, the homeless, arts and culture, not-for-profits, and many families in need. So if you'd like to help, you can go to greaterharlemchamber.com, greaterharlemchamber.com for more information. Harlem is a wonderful place, and uh, that's why... We have What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander, and today we're so fortunate to have uh, Miss Sarah Dash. You know, sir, there is something else I'm, I'm, I'm remembering, and I want to remember if it's accurate or not. Do you remember when Stevie Wonder had Superstition? That was his hit. And we gave a Stevie Wonder concert at a place on 79th and Broadway called the Asu Soul. It was down in a, uh, like, you had to go down the stairs. Were you there? People told me you were there. I didn't see you because it was jam-packed, uh, very crowded. Do you, do you remember that? Were you there at all? I often, follow, I often went to Stevie Wonder's concerts, and I do remember being, I, in fact, I sat at the table with Bob Higginson that night, I believe. Okay, yes. great. Now, yes. okay, 
because some people told me that you were there and I said, where, where? I, I didn't see her. And all these years, I've never really. Uh, uh, I didn't know you were there. And well, I was the host. <laughs> You're right, right. But I didn't know you were, I, mean, I should say, I didn't know you were coming. Um, uh, I, but I, the problem was I got sick mm -hmm. and I had to leave right at the top of the show. That That's what I happened. Heard, that I heard, I heard that. Yes, I had to go, I had yeah. to go. And I, I lived on um, 77th and West End, so I didn't mm. have far to go. But uh, yeah, so Steve, I had to leave that night, yes. Stevie played Superstition nine times that night. See, he, I missed all of that. I mean, he would, it, it, it would come to an end and he would start all over again and everybody just yeah. went crazy. And people were standing on tables and, and uh, you know, <laughs> the crowd, I mean, it was, it was great. So, okay, so you just uh, confirmed that for me that you were there. I always yes. wondered about that. Uh, is, is there anything in, going on in your life right now that you'd like to uh, let us know about? Yeah, yeah. There, there are a few things going on. I'm um, writing my memoir. Hmm. I um, got like five chapters done so far. Mm -hmm. um, don't know when it's coming out, but I'm working on working on them. Um, you will you'll say some, that you, book. You, yeah. you you'll say some nice things about me though in your memoirs, right? I'm telling the truth. Oh, <laughs> um, everything that I have experienced. Um, the one, the voice on Center Man is Jerry Butler. Come here, baby. Oh, wow. Jerry Butler told me to tell my story through the eyes of Sarah Gash. Uh, not to be affected by what someone would want to hear. Because he said in reading it, people will be able to know whether you're telling the truth or making it up. Mm -hmm. And as a performer, you have such, and we have such uh, sensational lives, I will say, you know, and I've come to find that out to having to stay in. You know, it's like, oh, I have to do the laundry. But anyway, <laughs> we have stories that are people just don't believe that they have existed. Uh, you, you really went through that, you know? I mean, missing flights that crash. Wow. You know, and, and the purpose behind it. So that's one of the things that I'm doing. Um, I'm also working on new music. I've talked to Steve Jordan. If you're listening, um, we're talking about uh, doing uh, a different sound. Well, it's actually the sound that Steve Jordan and Keith Richards always got me to sing the, the tones. If you listen to the, the um, recordings that I did with the expensive winos, we're, you know, we are going back to that um, sound and uh, I hope that my uh, fans and people who um, you know support my work will also support this sound that I'm about to attempt to do and that takes me to a place where um, a song called um, Don't Make Me Wait I did with Ray Goodman and Brown mm -hmm. um, about what six years ago well they released it and it's um, a, someone called it a lost gem. And that sound in my voice is what you're going to hear in the new phase of my musical life. I'm also painting, you know, getting to, you know, my paint brushes, they're still in my classroom. But I also, I'm, you know, I work with, um, Sprout U. I'm the music administrator, uh, director rather, and one of the school's administrators. Um, and that's a school here in Trenton. Uh, so I I direct their vocal talents, and I'm and aside from that, I'm still well, I still teach. Uh, I'm also about to create a new music uh, program. A historical program for another college here in New Jersey mm -hmm. uh, as the um, program that I created for the College of New Jersey was such a, a success they decided to put me on the 
um, college magazine, magazine. And that one, the national magazine cover, we beat out uh, Yale and Harvard um, picture with me on there. So that encouraged me to work more with students to um, create more, um, to give more knowledge about the history of artists and particularly black artists where we uh, a lot of times uh, we haven't always been given the credit that we deserve, you know, for the work that we've done. Um, we are the root of music. And uh, that is one of the things that I will never, ever let anyone forget when I'm teaching. I, I'm also a motivational speaker, as you know. Mm -hmm. And the last program that I spoke at was a church in D.C., for National Women's History Day. Um, and that uh, just to be able to get on a stand at a podium and talk about, you know, how I have been blessed and the many things that I've gone through, um, it's something that, you know, I will continue to do when this lifted again. Uh, and we're able to socialize. You are on the. Um governing body of the Grammys. Yes, I turned out actually last uh, June. In you June. Did. Well, t tell us, is there anything about the Grammys that we don't know that the public would, would, would enjoy hearing about the, the inside or, you know, the, the, the inside workings of the Grammys? The workings? Yes. Well, we're, being a governor, we represent all the people who are in our chapter, I mean, with the Philadelphia chapter. And as a governor, we sit there and we hear the changes that will affect the musicians and the singers. Uh, we, we get those, uh, we get the information about what the new technologies will be, uh, what new producers are, on, um, are coming out the new artists and what they're doing. Uh, we also embellish, um, no, we don't embellish. What we do, we embrace mm -hmm. the city that we represent and we try to get involved in programs that are a part of the Philadelphia chapter. We had people who sat on the board who went to different schools, who sat with the city and changed some programs. Mm -hmm. Deanna Williams was president of the chapter. Uh, changed, um, you know, brotherly love and uh, city of brotherly love and sister affection. You know, she's changed that. Um, we, within the inner workings, we we sit and we talk about the issues that that can only help not just artists, but the music in total community. How it affects how our artistry affects the community. Um, when it comes time, I'm a voting member. Mm -hmm. I take it very serious. If you submit your work to the Grammy and you are a member, you know, we as voting members have an opportunity to listen. And it's really, you know, our taste uh, not goes because we know you, but it's because of the quality of work. And I take that very seriously. Uh, I sit on the advocacy board. I was there. Uh, I, we go to our constituency politics, that is, uh, once a year, and we sit there and we tell them about the problems that we have, not being able to collect our royalties from offshore, mm -hmm. uh, been placing bills on the floor uh, during this pandemic time uh, so that artists who have no income right now. I'm one of them, you know. Um, and we are designing, we're going to the government and saying, you have to take care of art form. This is an art form that is part of America. And to get funding to help those who really need it. Um, so that's the Grammys. Uh, we call it the Recording Academy as well. Um, we have a new CEO, an interim, who is Harvey Mason, who is a fantastic um, producer. And, you know, he's worked with 
uh, Michael Jackson, so many artists. And he uh, came in as a chair, but now because of the problems we had last year, um, he stepped in to be the interim CEO. And uh, they're making great uh, leaps and bounds and changes and how women are affected in the industry. There was a complaint about that. So now we are recognizing and we're lifting them up. You know, we as, as women um, are now being recognized by the Recording Academy in such a beautiful way. Um, there are uh, trustees, you know, there's membership committees, uh, there's nominating committees. So all these things are uh, vital right now and they're becoming um, into light as to how much we who are members and longtime members um, care about other artists. Wow. So, so when the Grammys are, you know, when people are nominated for the Grammys, is that because you're one of the people who who had to listen to the music to make a decision who's going to be nominated? Uh, how does that work? When when an artist is nominated, um, it's because of their work has been submitted. We base our decisions based upon the quality of work, the work, the not because we like I said, it's because I like you or I, you know, it's really down to the quality of the work that you present. Um, and it's down to, if you don't submit your song, we can't nominate you or you can't be nominated. You have to, there's a process that you go through mm -hmm. to submit a record that you have out. Um, if you put a song out and it has not been, um, if you haven't put it in to be nominated, you have five years to submit a song once it's been released. Oh, um, okay. And anytime within the five year period, mm -hmm. you can um, submit your song to have to be recognized. I see, I see. Yeah. All right. So, and, and, and in that process, we've got about two minutes left, but in that process uh, of being nominated, is there a, a fee that someone's got to also, when they send their, their record in, they, they have to pay a fee in order to, to, to be nominated or, or, or how does that work? I've always No, there's that. no fee. There's if no you're fee. a member, you're already paying membership dues. Okay. So it's, uh, if you're a member, most likely you will be submitting your records or your music to be selected. And it okay. goes through a process. Um, I just finished voting in the first round. It took me nearly four hours to, you know, go through the different categories mm -hmm. to, um, and I can't tell you who I voted for. I can't, you know, I, that can't happen. But there, in a couple categories, there were over thousands of um, uh, uh, records are submitted to us, wow. and, and, and you some have to you don't you know, and some you do know, and you listen, and wow. you say, "Wow, that's a great song," you know. Wow, incredible! Well, we've got uh, about thirty seconds left before we go to the break, and uh, I want to tell you, I'm really enjoying this conversation with you. And uh, when we come back, I'm going to ask you some. Uh, questions that uh, hmm, it might be a little personal, but we'll, we will see. So ladies well, and gentlemen. I'm here, I'm here to view and spew. All right. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for being with us and uh, don't go away. We'll be right back with What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. Tune in every Friday to get your weekend kickoff early. Join the legendary G. Keith Alexander for What's Hot Harlem America. The flagship show of the new Harlem America Digital Network has something for everyone. From the latest in entertainment to empowerment, health and wellness, and more, we'll bring you a variety of fresh viewpoints, voices, and ideas. What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander can be heard every Friday at 1 p.m. in New York and 10 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Variety Channel. Well, I just want to say that, uh, you know, 
I want to give a shout out to all the folks in Harlem and New York uh, listening to us right now. And, and uh, while I'm doing that, I want to, again, say hello and acknowledge the people listening in Canada, uh, in China, Ireland, Jamaica, and in France and other places. And I want to remind you guys that you can stay connected from work, home, and on the road. Uh, please remember to add the Harlem America Digital Network's What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander to your iPhone and iPad. And all you have to do is just download the official Voice America Talk Radio Network app. It's at, it's, it's at the uh, Apple Store. It's easy to use. It's always free. And you can tell a friend. And I just want to thank you in advance for downloading it, okay? And now... We're with uh, the wonderful Sarah. We've been having a great time here. And now, Sarah, I want to, you know, get it a little personal here. What are some of the, the fun times, uh, exciting times that you've had with LaBelle? You guys either on the road or uh, 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 off the road. What are some of the, the, the fun times that you guys have had together, the memorable times? Yeah, we... Um... <laughs> Having spent so many years together, uh, we grew up together. You know, we started out with a chaperone and the manager, and that was the only way our parents, well, my parents were willing to let me go on the road. Um, you know, it had to have that. And we set a precedence for uh, other record companies and sending out teenage girls to, uh, in the industry. Um, we, we played tricks on people. Uh, you know, uh, we would get Nona to act as if she was having a uh, seizure. I know it's so <laughs> cool. And, and, and because Nona was endowed, you know, so yes. it was like we would get her to pretend she was having a seizure. And Patty and I would run around, get a spoon, get a spoon. And the other, we had nothing to do in between shows at the Apollo or at whatever whatever theater it was. Uh -huh. And our boredom ran into teasing people or making pretend that we were in problems. And we always did it when our chaperone and manager went out to get our dinner or our lunch. And they come <laughs> back and they're, they see people like Chuck Jackson and, you know, the temptations going, I'll never speak to them anymore. And, 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 and that was because Nona would pretend she was falling out and shaking and frothing at the mouth. And we go, we run and go, we need help. We need help. <laughs> <laughs> well, she did it to Bob Schiffman of the Apollo. Right. Okay. Bobby. And so he was so furious with us. Meanwhile, we're the sweethearts there. And we did this horrible thing to him. But, you know, so we go to Europe and we come back. And it's our, we actually landed in New York and that very next day, we were opening the Apollo. Well, Bob had, Bobby Schiffman had his detective friends come up to our dress room and tell Nona that she was under arrest because they felt she bought some drugs or something back from New York. And they would have to detain her and they walked her through the audience and then down through the front, so all the people were saying, what did she do? And Patty's running around going, she didn't do anything. We never do drugs. We never do anything. Bobby Schiffman had them open the side door and pull the wagon up as if they were going to lock, take Nona away. We were all crying and screaming. We, that ended that whole time of playing that trick on people. We never played it again. Wow. You know, that was, it was a horrible thing to do, you know? Incredible. Well, <laughs> but we were children, you know? And uh, as adults, you know, we growing up, you know, Patty got married, I got married. And, um, you know, we still had that child thing in us, you know, childlike behavior. When we're together, it's nobody else is in the room when the three of us are together. And we've had some, you know, we've had some great, times we've had some slow times mm -hmm. it was feast or famine for a while with us in in the industry and uh you know we had to put our quarters and pennies together and but we always knew that um no matter what we had each other's back 
you know, um, you know, with uh, no matter what, you couldn't, you could, she and uh, we could talk about each other. But if someone came in and said, oh, she said, no, you would get your head bitten. <laughs> you could not do that. And you still can't do that to this day. Hmm. Well, yeah. well, okay. So during that time of um, uh, Lady Marmalade. Yes. Uh, was, 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 was Patty cooking then uh, backstage? When, when did that start? That, that well, Patty we, become we were famous for cooking? We restaurant food. And one day I just said, I'm going to buy um, a, a teapot or something. I don't like the way they make their coffee. And from that, our chaperone said, I'm going to cook some food. And then we would start, it started staying in hotels where we could cook. And Pat made the best, still to this day, the best fried chicken ever, mm -hmm. that I've ever tasted. Um, she um, started cooking. Uh, we would come to, <clears throat> we would be rehearsing. And a lot of times the rehearsals would be at my house because I had the piano, which you know. Mm -hmm. And we would rehearse in, at my apartment. Um, and we would cook there. And Pat started, she would make the best chili and we were just loving the food. And um, th th then we would have card games and um, Vivian Reed would make the best uh, macaroni salad. Uh, you know, we were, there's <laughs> always someone cooking. I did uh, a lot of uh, soul food, old school as they call it, cooking, you know, the red beans and the ham hocks when oh. I was, you know. And, um, but Patty was always a good cook. And she had uh, such an innovative mind, you know, uh, with her cooking. Uh, who knew it would lead to her being the Black Martha Stewart, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know what, Patty, if you're listening, Patty, I, 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 I can see another uh, product for you, Patty's Chicken. Okay, so. <laughs> she does have, I think, chicken, um, chicken and dumplings, I believe. Oh, really? She has that, yeah. So um, we're doing your commercial, Patty. We're, she also has popcorn. She has the, the cobblers and the pies, Patty wow. pies. Really? Yeah. Well, wow. you know, I've yet to have a Patty pie. And uh, I, I know that, uh, you know, they're, they're very good because I've had friends tell me about them. But mm -hmm. I don't even know where to get them, you know. Uh, but uh, but I you're going gonna, gonna to see a cookbook for me soon. Oh, really? Oh, good. Yeah, good, that's good. another project that I'm working on and uh, a book of poetry mm -hmm. is coming soon too. Oh, great. So, yeah. uh, so, so you are still very active and still, uh, uh, I guess, growing and, and, and becoming still the chapter of your book has not been closed yet. You, you're still, I, you, you, you're still writing that chapter. Um, it, it, I think it will always be a chapter written each, at the end of each week. I journalize every day. I journalize my dreams. Uh, I remember your mom sending some information about dreams. Mm, uh, you remember you that, huh? in the middle of the night at a certain hour mm -hmm. uh, what the meaning of your dreams would mean when you woke up. You sent that to me from her once. Right. Um, um, so I've, I've been journalizing a lot more since the pandemic, um, but um, it's, it's really important that you follow that spirit that you have when it comes to creativity and be open for doors to open for you. Mm -hmm. um, so every day there's something new to think about in terms of you know, having a chapter there is no, there, there are chapters, but the book is still open as long as you're alive. You know, there's always something that someone will call you about. Um, you know, I, I enhanced my studies for theology and I became a chaplain, which I'm a chaplain now. Oh, really? Yes. Um, and I did it without telling anyone that I was doing these particular studies. And um, I, had, um, I had an accident and I was in a cast and my sister picked up my mail and she's like, there's something in here, but it's wet. And she turns around, she looks at me, she says, this certifies you as a chaplain? You never told me 
that you were studying to be a chaplain. Um, I write prayers daily for people and send them to my family and friends. I find affirmations that might be appropriate for someone's life, or I just let the spirit guide me as to what to send to others. Mm -hmm. And so I felt if I could write a prayer, then let me certify myself in this society. And I became a chaplain, you know, Whoa. because, you know, my dad was a pastor. I, I'm a PK. Oh, okay. You know, for, and for those who don't know. Was, yeah. For those who so don't I know what a PK is, Bible, you know, yeah, for those who don't know what a PK is, it's a pastor's kid. Is that it? Yeah. Preacher's kid, pastor's preacher's kid. kid. Okay. Yes. And uh, my mom, you know, she was in the field of nursing after mm -hmm. having 13 children. So I had wow. great guides. Hmm? 13 children? I'm number seven of 13 children. Cheese and crackers. Yes. Wow. Yes. Most people think I'm an only child because I'm a brat sometimes. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, yes. So I had great teachers. I had, you know, growing up in the home. I'm actually in the home that I grew up in right now. Mm -hmm. I restored it. Oh, nice. But I had wonderful teaching um, uh, guides from my parents. Um, you know, watching my father, you know, as a preacher, the various businesses that he involved himself in. He was a scrap and metal man, which was very rare for black men. Um, real estate. And, and the word was never, had never left his lips. You know, he's the father of the state of New Jersey on the Bishop Honor. He, he would have us praying um, in the morning growing up at six o'clock in the morning. We were on our knees in the really? living room, you know. Um, eventually that stopped because I could, I don't know what my mom said, but I can only imagine, you know, all the bathrobes, all the, uh, the come downstairs, and, you know. <laughs> you can imagine what kind of talks they had. Having and, and, about the children, you know, and, and and that was before you went to school in the morning. And that was before I went to school in the morning. Wow. So you know the um the, the, they told the funny stories are they told we ran into a woman who knew us as children, and she said that whenever we arrived at the church, we would come in and we had our own pew, and we fluffed out our dresses, and no one else could sit on that pew with us. Hmm. There were nine girls, you know. And we wouldn't let anyone touch our clothes. We had our little gloves. You didn't touch us in church. You could not. <laughs> wow. you know, come home dirty, you have a problem, you know. <laughs> well, well, Sarah? <clears throat> yes? Th we've got about a minute and a half left, and yeah. I want to tell you that this has really been a pleasure to sit with you and uh, talk with you and, uh, and laugh with you, and I'm very happy that things are going very well for you. You did mention something about a mild depression uh, that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, Michelle, Michelle. Mom, she, she, she made it comfortable for us to admit that having to stay in, um, it was, it, she made it all right by saying there's low grade depression. So I don't know whether I have it or not, but I would think I would, um, you know, because staying in, I have underlying conditions, one being my age and the other, I found out a couple of years ago uh, that I'm diabetic. So I have to stay in. And when I go to the dentist, I have 14 days of quarantine after which it's just uh, the doctor is the same thing. Um, I've started many projects in this home, but, well, you know. Well, Sarah, I'm sorry. We're going to have to leave it right there because I'm going to have to close. But oh. this has been wonderful. And thank you so very, very much. And thank I wanna... you. And love you all. The Dash family, love you all. I love you all, all of you who are listening. Thank you. Support Keith when he comes back on next Friday. Thank you Tell very much. Tell him to have back on once a month. No, just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day and a better one tomorrow. And I'll see you next week at the same time on Harlem America with What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. Thank you. Have a great Bye. day.
Bye.